Goat gangsters are in here terrorizing. Hey! You can hang out and quit eating everything. Little shits. I'm all packed and ready to go. Kind of killed me not going fishing today. Don't rub that tripod. Um, it's tough to go, you know, when you finally find a handful of steelhead and then uh, you see that thing down on the bottom of the screen. Can't get around that way, dummy. Come here. All right, anyway, uh, yeah, it's tough to leave after finding a handful of fish like that, knowing I could probably go back in there and catch a few more today, but what more does a guy need, right? A handful of fights with wild steelhead on the West Coast. Good soul food right there, I'm good. And, oh, a pile of people have had a bunch of emails, people asking me with the actual title, why are you letting those fish go? Well, the speech is as fragile as it is. Need all the help they can get. And uh, being an angler, uh, having an ocean boat, guide boat, I gotta move those goats. They're up on the bench where all the camera gear is now. Um, anyway, quick answer though. Uh, I've got, we have salmon and halibut in the freezer. We can eat that. And the hatcheries do a big effort to produce more salmon as well. And unfortunately, this is a fact, they decided not to enhance the steelhead because it didn't make enough money. <laughs> Which makes you wanna puke because what are you thinking? You can't go and annihilate a species and not bring it back because it doesn't make you money. That's ridiculous. You, we, annihilate species due to overfishing and logging, changing the temperatures of the water and the river, whatever it was, the fact is we killed them, we replaced them. It doesn't matter if they make you money or not, right? They're so lame, so weak. So anyways, yeah, I catch them, release the steelhead. We have fish in the freezer and uh, if Maybe you're not familiar with angling or not, but to catch a wild steelhead is that easy. When you do, it's just that you get that, that blast of electricity and adrenaline through your entire core. The second you feel that rod get pulled, it's pretty freaking cool. It's very, very exciting for an avid angler to catch a steelhead, especially a wild steelhead. So yeah, six, six battles yesterday, six individual fights. Mm. Good enough for me. And it goes back in a second. All right. <laughs> Had to close the shop door. So it's, it just causes a little more echo until I get this, this place done in here and geared up for doing this. And then all this shit on the walls, I'll put in its right place. And then uh, I'm gonna be able to keep all the animals out. But like the goats, they're, they're just like bad little kids. <laughs> they, they follow you around. They need to be included with absolutely anything and everything we do here. And when we're inside the house, they sit at the glass door on the back deck, staring in the window at you like, come on, let's go. <laughs> so once you come inside, especially on a rainy day, they don't leave you alone, especially when I come in here. Anyways, what was I saying? Catch release in the fish. Yes, yeah, fragile fish, very special fish species. They need all the help they can get. And being an avid, any angler, any avid angler that lives on the West Coast is going to have your more common eating fish, salmon, and halibut in the freezer, so. Good on the fish, I got no problems setting those majestic fish free. Now, my last share from inside for a while. Also had a handful of people emailing me, cautioning me, people of wanting to harm me or not let them know my schedule, et cetera, et cetera. One thing many people don't understand is how secure it actually is here with our our neighbors, friends, and I think there's going to be like five or six people here the entire time I'm gone. It's not like the place is empty, believe me. And as far as I go, what? Somebody's going to go out of their way to, to hunt down the hunting guide because he keeps sharing people's honest encounters on YouTube? <laughs> it's not going to happen. Anyway, what else do we got? Hold on a second here. Uh, yeah, it's pretty funny yesterday. Honestly, I'm still laughing. I don't know why. I don't know why. Now, now it's like uh, I hear the term, the term celebrity wildlife biologist keeps popping up in my head and it makes me laugh every time. I think that, I don't know why. I don't know why. It just makes me laugh my freaking balls off. And it, I mean, seriously, think about it, you guys. Could you imagine? Especially if you're like a renowned place, you know, one of the number one podcasts in the world and you want to get to the bottom of the Sasquatch thing so you, you invite not only just a wildlife biologist, 
Imagine, imagine if you were honestly curious about this topic and you thought, oh, I'll just get a wildlife biologist on this, on the, in front of me at the table. That'll, that'll solve everything. <laughs> Do you see the humor in that? It's so ridiculous. It makes me laugh my freaking head off. But then to toss in a celebrity wildlife biologist to clear things up for you on the Sasquatch topic. Why the hell didn't we do that at the beginning, right? I'm sorry, that's day two of laughing at that. I can't shake it. <laughs> what else? Uh, uh, what else? I, I, I got a few mo notes down here I wanted to kind of mention because I always walk away forgetting. I got the catch and release thing mentioned. The experience is shared. Some of you are to me too, but and I've been doing this, I've been doing this for two years, seriously. Two freaking years I've been sharing everybody's everybody's experiences. That's ridiculous. Because I think I don't I don't count anything ever. I've never I don't count anything. Like I don't count how many emails go into a video. I don't count nothing. So but I would imagine there's like at least half a dozen, isn't there? Yeah, so you imagine how many people have been hurt so far and just how common the shit is. And it does well how many times people, how many different people have emailed in. It just goes to show us all just how much the bullshit keepers have kept from the people over the years. That small group of people who have somehow controlled the narrative to a point when it comes to this topic. Isn't it ridiculous how much they refuse to talk about, how much they refuse to address, how much they refuse to share publicly from people sharing with them in confidence and private? Isn't that ridiculous? Doesn't it just show, it exposes a lot when it comes to the so-called big names <laughs> of the uh, Bigfoot Sasquatch community, right? Prove me I'm wrong. As far as I'm concerned, the more people come forward, the more they share honestly, the more these people get, get exposed for what they have been, opportunists when it comes to this topic. Anyways, I'll try to bite my lip. Which isn't too hard. I can bite my lip, especially when it comes to that topic of other people. People marketing a channel too, right? So I got a lot of people emailing me this past week about some other channels speaking about myself, I guess, or this channel, whatever. And uh, just so you guys know, I, I'll never forget in the earlier stages of this when I first came out, and I came out swinging. I was kind of, I was kind of ready to fight anybody when it came to this topic, so I'd had enough of the bullshit, and uh, I felt out of respect for my grandfather. And especially Dr. John Bennett, I go see the people who died not, not knowing the truth and the people who died being scared of the people uh, was what triggered me for real to say, yeah, F everybody. I seen them. I know about them. It's true. It's fact. I didn't ask for it. And if you don't like it, ram it up your ass. And there isn't a man big enough to make me shame me into changing my story of what happened. Just isn't. So anyways, and uh, yeah, I came up pretty strong in the beginning and I... Basically, I just read, read the writing on the wall, the truth, right? The truth, the bullshit circle keepers, the people who have kept all of you going in an endless circle of no return when it comes to this topic. And anyways, um, yeah, they're about as intimidating as that speck of frickin' dust on the floor, as far as I'm concerned. It's like I got no problem speaking the truth. But anyway, but in return, it was comical, entertaining for me and others, a small handful of others. I specifically remember talking to Dave, me and Dave Plass or texting, and I remember saying to them, I can't believe how stupid these people are. I just cannot believe it. They are actually going out of their way to make videos about me and Dave, right? They want us to be discredited and shut up so bad, yet they're so stupid. A handful of these ding dongs actually marketed, promoted and marketed this channel and me and as well David Plaza and others non-stop for free. <laughs> it was actually, it was amazing for me to watch, but not surprising though, because for me, a bunch of these people are definitely emotionally challenged, mentally challenged, whatever you want to call it, they're freaking challenged. So, and there's your proof of the pudding. If you, Ever want somebody that has some kind of, a of, of coverage, you want them to go away. You want them to be quiet. You want the message they have to share to stop. The key is, is to not mention their name ever at all costs, right? Why do you think I keep telling everybody to 
kick mainstream media to the side. You have to gong mainstream media. It's a tool, it's a weapon, it's used to fuck all of you up. That's the truth. That's why I say, don't give it a second. The only way they have power is if their names and the title and the channels, whatever comes out of your mouth. Boom, they got you. They got the attention, they got the promotion. Right? So, thank you for your concern. What I'm getting at is thank you for your concern for a fair amount of people that have emailed in saying some other channels or whoever is saying some bad things about this channel. Just so you know, all they're doing is promoting this channel and all of you on this channel. That's all they're doing. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter. Okay? So there you go. I'm rambling and babbling. And there's more important voices to be heard than mine, so let's get into it. Now, what have I got? Nothing's pre-read, so let's see what happens here. All right, here's one. I, I just, what I do is I, I go down to my list, past the red, burp, 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 and then I get to a big volley of unread ones, and then I'll just randomly mark them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ish, and that automatically puts it at the top, and then I read through them. That's what I do. I'm sure there's some, some better ways to do it, but I'm not that, uh, I'm not that organized when it comes to this shit, obviously. But here we go, listen to this. This is titled Bad Canoe Trip. Hi Steve, I'm a 60 plus year old guy that likes to hike in the woods. Back in 1982, I was invited to go on a company canoeing trip with my buddy on the Lay River. It's either Lay or Lee River in PA. Frickin' Pennsylvania, man. What's up with Pennsylvania? Why is it so common for this shit to be going on and other shit to be going on around the state of Pennsylvania and Ohio and Utah and upstate New York, Florida, Texas, Oklahoma, like there's a, there's a good, there's a fair, Alaska, there's a fair handful of states where shit goes on so commonly, it kind of makes you just want to almost go look in and go, okay, what's going on here, man? Why? Why those particular areas so, so often, so common, although every single state and province has sightings. But man, Pennsylvania comes up nonstop. It was a great experience for the city boy. So they started early pairing people in a boat before going down the river. There were a lot of us. I was with an Asian guy that spoke Spanish named Hugo. So from get-go, it was interesting. We headed downstream in the middle of the group, slowly paddling by the rocks that poked out when you least expect it. The view was beautiful. People up ahead were jumping off a high ledge into the water, having fun. Then about midday, me and Hugo got into some rough stuff when he yelled at me to paddle left. The right. The canoe hit a big group of rocks in the middle of the river. Hugo went flying. He was not hurt and was picked up by others passing by. I was left in a canoe that was bending around the rocks. The boat was starting to crack, so I lifted it up and away from the rocks to the shore. The place that I dragged the canoe was a patch of gravel on one side of the water and solid stone mountain on the other. On my side, it sloped upward from tall reeds until it got to a road with train tracks, then just woods going upwards. As I started fixing the canoe that had a crack on both sides, I felt strange. Someone was watching me. Everyone passed me by, so it could not be them. As I worked, I noticed a figure in the reeds just before the tracks, a tall human form swaying side to side. I dismissed it as a random shadow. When I finished the boat, I moved it slowly to the water, looking over my shoulder, and it was moving with me. I felt a wave of terror run down my spine. The canoe went in the water, and I paddled as fast as possible. Just then, the loudest roar slash yell came from where that thing was. Three times I heard it. When I got to the group, they were on the shore having a picnic. When my buddy saw the patch job in the canoe, he said he did not know how I, how I could do fix it with what I had. How could I do fix it with what I had? Type up. I told him I was motivated. I pushed that out of my mind until I heard that sound six years ago. I was listening to the radio late at night. Art Bell, he had a couple of people that recorded the Savvy people, and it all came back. The terror, the tremors through my body, and then wet my pants. I thank you for letting me share this. You're doing a great thing. My sorrow for you, Mr. Macaroni, is love will last forever. Thanks again. Long and crawl. All right, man. Thanks for that email. Appreciate it. 
swaying side to side, it's only been mentioned about five zillion times, right? And when they sway side to side, they want you to see them. They either want you to see them, or I don't know, who knows? I can say some speculation things are speculated. I'm not going to, because somebody would probably think that I, I know that ultimately, and that's the way it is, which I don't, but you remember Edgar's story of what that being was doing when he saw it. It was jumping up and down, and it was, and it, there was something changing about it, right? Now I wonder if the swaying side by side could be possibly the tail end of them doing whatever it is they need to do to change what we are seeing when you look at them. I don't know. It's a, it's a thought, because it's too common of a movement, right? Um, yeah, the swaying side to side. It's a common movement, and if they wanted you to see them, why don't they just wave their hand? Hey, I'm right here. You know what I mean? But they all do this, this, this stepping back and forth, swaying side by side. I wonder why, right? But the more we learn, the more I think it's got, it has something to do with how or when they either let us see it, see them, or not see them, possibly, right? All right, what's this one? So it's the title Attention, Steve. Hello, Steve, you use my name if you wish. My name is Rob Taylor, and I'm from Central West Virginia. When I was much younger, and when I was much younger, I'm 57 as of 2021, we had a camp that was a stone's throw from Watoga State Park. Our camp is in a very small town called Siebert, pronounced Siebert. <laughs> Nailed it. I loved going there. In the summer, you could catch fish all day and night on the Greenbrier River. And in the fall, we have trout streams everywhere from Knapps Creek to the Cranberry Glades. And in the winter, of course, hunting deer, turkey, grouse, groundhog, whatever was in season, it's roaming Pocahontas County as well as another being, of course, sorry, whatever was in season is roaming Pocahontas County as well as another being, of course. Anyway, my story. It's midsummer and a couple of my cousins want to accompany me and my dad to do some fishing. My dad and I would go up to camp a few times every summer whenever he could get away for the weekend. Our camp was three or four hours drive from where we lived, so we couldn't get there as much as we wanted. The first day was great. We got there Friday evening and got to get in a couple hours of day fishing. And after fishing for a little bit, we were all tired and decided to go back to camp and unpack and get some vittles down our neck. After all that, we all just fell out and went to sleep. The next day, Saturday, we got up early and started hitting all the good spots. A few my dad, a few my dad had to drive us to to get there. All the others were walking distance. You could almost cast your line from the front door and hit the river. Damn, I miss those times with my dad. We did a couple hours night fishing, but they weren't hitting. Anyway, we tried, so we... Anyway, sorry, anything we tried. So we decided to head back to camp and hang out. Built a fire in the pitch, in the pit outside, and just sit around and bullshit with each other and lie about the one that got away. So now it's going on about 10 o'clock. And my dad had to get down to the store before the close and get supplies for breakfast and lunch for tomorrow. The store was only about a half a mile from camp, so my two cousins, one from my mother's side and the other from my dad's, both first cousins, and I decided to go inside to keep out of the boredom. We ended up getting into a pillow fight and carrying on like 12-year-old boys do. We were getting loud with the laughter and antics when we hear someone pounding on the sides of the cabin and it even sounded like whoever it was got on the roof and pounded and growled. That was suck. My cousin said it's probably your dad trying to scare us, but my dad was straight up no bull shitting around, so I knew it wasn't him. And all of a sudden the lights go out, and after another minute of pounding on the outside of the cabin, the lights came back on and flicker on and off for about 30 seconds. By this time I'm starting to get a little bit scared because I know it's not my dad. There's only one window in the bedroom we're in, and that's, where it's, and that's where it sounds like whoever, whatever is doing this. Everything is dead quiet, and then one of the worst smells I've ever experienced in my life. One of my cousins said it's a skunk, and I've encountered a skunk before, and this is the smell of skunk and rotten meat and sewage. It made my eyes water, and all three of us were about to puke. I could hear like a real long and low guttural growl at the window. The lights are now back on without flickering, and I'm wishing my dad would hurry the hell up and get back from the store. I hear the gravel being kicked around, so I'm thinking, Dad's back. 
So I slowly go over to the window and real slow pull back the curtain, taking up the whole window. It is a dark shadow of a head and I see two blood red glowing eyes looking back at me, not a foot away from my head. We all screamed. I closed the curtain and jumped into the bed and under the covers, we all three went screaming for our lives, scared to death. Then we heard another loud deafening scream and the lights went out again. We're shaking and trying to be as quiet as we can. All of a sudden, one more loud as hell smack beside the window and then silence. A silence so silent my ears are ringing. Nothing else happened and from what I could tell, we eventually fell asleep. Very early the next morning, I run into my dad's room and wake him up and he said, when we got back, that every light inside the camp was turned on and all three of us were under the covers from head to toe sleeping. So we put away the food and went to bed. I told him what happened to us and he said, it was probably the back lights on a car that I saw and it was not taillights standing at the window. I went outside after breakfast and looked around the cabin and the hardy board siding was broken in 10 to 20 different places and you could see handprints, big handprints, but no footprints. And at, the, and at the window, there was a handprint on each side of it. And there was also about five or six pieces of shingles laying on the ground. My dad couldn't explain the handprints. And he said that us kids must have done that. And that the wind blew the shingles off. We just wanted to go home. And go home now. My dad went fishing beside the camp for 30 minutes or so. And saw that we weren't even going outside. So we packed everything up and headed home. My cousins never asked to go fishing with us again, and we never spoke about it to anyone, or even amongst ourselves again. I've told a couple of my closest family, but I don't think they believe me. I didn't mention to them that my cousins were even there. I just said what I saw one time, and when my dad and I went up camp. I didn't let it deter me from going back. I continued to hunt and fish and enjoy nature, especially, spent, especially time spent with my dad. It was that same year that I bagged my first deer, and I swear while I field dressed it that I was being watched and followed as I drugged the deer out of the woods. I couldn't get back to camp fast enough. It was terrorizing, but I still went back. There was nothing that was going to keep me from spending time with my dad. This all took place about 45 years ago. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate all you do. Keep up the good work and get people's stories out there, even if mine's not one of them. Been watching you for a while now. Started when you were guiding people on hunting. I think my first time watching you, one of the guys fell or was bucked off his horse and cracked his head open. I think they were hunting for a round. I'm not sure. It's been a while. Thanks again. All right, man. Rob, I absolutely, absolutely appreciate that. You taking that time out to send that email to us. Yeah, the hunter, he's up there. He's a Mexican up there, Ram. Fell off his horse and went down to the low side, side hilling on a big rock slide and, uh, Cracked his head wide open, right to the frickin' skull. And make a long story short, I wouldn't let him go home. It was a ride-in camp. It was, two, it was a day and a bit to ride in. It was the last hunt, and I had a side bet for the, longest, for the biggest ram, too. But anyway, uh, yeah, I ended up getting an 11 year old ram, and, and he got his mountain goat. It was a pretty crazy experience, the story. But anyways, enough, it's not about my story. Um, you should send this channel to your family members, maybe. Especially this story that you just shared with us, right? That just might, might make them knee-jerk to uh, getting their heads out of their asses and listening to their family, right? Too often people do not believe another. It's only because they're scared. They don't want to. They don't want to know about it. <laughs> I've come across way too many people now. That's the case. So I'm, I'm not as frustrated with people as I used to be because I realize it's only because they don't want nothing to do with this they don't want anything to do with even the possibility of this shit's going on. They don't want to know. That's fine by me. I don't give a shit. Who knows? I really don't give a shit. Who knows if this is true or not. I give a shit about every single person who's curious. I don't need to push out anybody. But more importantly is every single one of these tens of thousands of freaking people that are emailing us. Right? Alright. Bite my lip. Here's another story you might find interesting. I sent you the story of my Bigfoot experience. I'm a new viewer of your channel. You may have read it, and I missed it, or perhaps it got lost in the shuffle. Excuse me. 
Nevertheless, here's another story. A little off topic, but it might tickle your interest. You may use my name, Walt Hegman, if you like. Okay, fasten your seatbelt. This gets into the area of strange. I mentioned before that I have spiritual dreams. Two, two incidents over a number of years melded together in a common theme. The first was in, I think, around 2002. In that dream, I found myself in Alaska. A lot of things dreams are just, a lot of things in dreams are just, un, are just understood, even though I've never been to Alaska. I was on the tundra approaching what I knew to be a Native American shaman from behind. I moved up to where I could see over his shoulder. He had a long, he had on a thong around his neck, white cube about the size of one that those fuzzy dice we used to hang from the rearview mirror back in the 50s and 60s, except it was glossy. He placed all his fingers on it and writing in an unknown script began scrolling on all sides. When he did that, he realized I was there and I got the backstory on the cube. It seems the CIA, CIA had given a bunch of them to shamans in Alaska and, a witch doctors, and to witch doctors in South Africa to help them contact the spirit world and do remote sensing for them, the CIA. He turned around and began to tell me and show me in my mind all the things they would do to me if I ever came to Alaska. Horrendous, unspeakable things. I didn't hesitate to tell him that I had no plans of ever coming to Alaska, that if I did, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Upon hearing that, he ran away from me very fast and became a dot in the horizon. The second time was a series of dreams I had around 2011. In this instance, I found myself in a college lecture hall being given history lessons by various professors. On the fourth night, a fellow sitting in a couple of rows in front of me turned around and said, Oh, hi, I'm Dr. Franklin, and we're here at the Life Sciences, Sciences Institute in Delhi, India. If you need me, I'll be in the pit. I awoke from that dream. And as it was a Saturday morning, and I didn't have a computer in the house at that time, so I went down to the library and got on the internet to see what I could find about the Life Sciences Institute. I was somewhat shocked to find they existed, at least at that time. I haven't checked since. They were indeed in Delhi, and have been started by none other than Deepak Chopra. They were teaching transcendental meditation and remote sensor. I didn't find Dr. Franklin on their list of professors, but was relating the dream to a friend of mine who is a retired shrink, and he still has contacts in that world, and was able to check his sources. He found that Dr. Franklin was a visiting professor, he then told me he was familiar with the program, and that The Pit is an interactive video game they used to help teach remote sensor. Crazy! That night I found myself in that lecture hall again, and I marched up to the, le up to the lectern and told the person that they had better get out of my head or it was going to get very hot for them. I woke from that and have not been bothered since. End of story. Well, Walt, that's a crazy frickin' story, man. I've never heard anything close to that, I don't think, not yet here. But I have heard of the remote viewing. Who was I listening? I was listening to a guy Rumble, Michael Jacko, 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 I think. And this man's been around. I think he's a Green Beret or ex Special Forces or something, and he's been trained. Or maybe he went out and he learned how to do remote viewing, one or the other. So that's one of the people who's twigged my interest onto it. I don't know much about it. Do I believe it? Yeah, of course I do. Are you kidding me? The crazy shit going on on this planet that we aren't formally informed about. There's some crazy stuff going on, man. Thanks again for sending that in. It's going to trigger somebody to email us in or comment in the comment section below to add to it what you shared for sure. It's nonstop. I wonder how many, how many people we have shared here so far. Wouldn't that be amazing to know the exact number? So many. And there's and scenario too is a lot of people have emailed me saying they feel X amount of percentage of the emails are bullshit. Whatever, man. You know, I don't know who would qualify to be in that department when you, especially when you have seen these things yourself, it tells you flat out that anything is, anything is possible, right? So when you, you personally have come to the realization that anything is possible, well, who the hell qualifies to accept a bunch of the, these facts is true, but 
who qualifies to say or dictate that this might be bullshit. But, but this is bullshit over here. Nobody. Right. And another thing too, here's another thought that you want. Let's just say you had a chance to listen to 10 absolutely true, authentic Sasquatch Sabe being experiences. 10, 100% absolute fact. All right? But first you had to listen to how many that might not be fact. What would it be worth to you? Hmm? What would that ratio be? Would you be, would you be willing to listen to 100 bullshit Sasquatch stories knowing that after 100 or during that 100, you are going to get to hear 10 absolute truths, true stories, right? So what I'm saying is if any of you are here, you've already accepted the, accepted the facts of what's going on, but you find yourself sniveling a little bit because there might be some bullshit stories in there. Who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? They come and they go. Doesn't matter. Like I said before, somebody goes out of the way to email in a bullshit story that takes a shit pile of freaking energy and dedication, and all they do is discredit themselves. <laughs> That's it. That's all they do, right? You know, like I said before, nobody has ever said, hey, this is the story that I sent in and, it, and this is, uh, and it's all bullshit and here's the screenshot of my original email, just back it up, ha ha ha. Be like, oh, did you? Well, way to go, Skippy, because you just showed the world that you're, a, you're an idiot. Good for you, way to go. How are you gonna recover from that? Kick him to the curb, you keep going, right? So there you go. So any of you people who seem to be somehow concerned with a ratio of what might be bullshit and what might be true, oh well. I mean, can you imagine if you had to go watch mainstream news? What do you think the ratio is on mainstream news from the knowledge you think you may be acquiring from mainstream news? Hmm? I'd say I will bet you 90% plus that is drilled into the people from mainstream news is absolute bullshit and is harmful, harmful bullshit. Right? <laughs> it's pretty sad to think that a, a place where you get numerous Sasquatch experiences sent in has more credibility than all the frickin' mainstream news outlets combined. And that is what I believe is absolute truth myself. Anyway, sorry for that battle. Here we go, moving along. Aussie Sabe Encounter. Hi Steve, I thought I'd pass this on, an Aussie encounter. I've lived in the bush my entire life, I'm very aware. My intuition is never wrong and has saved my ass many times. I was 16 and gone out for a mountain bike for a motorbike ride. I turned the bike off and was sitting enjoying the quietness of the bush in a timbered area about 30 kilometers from the nearest town. All of a sudden, the bush sounds were quiet, and then there was an extremely terrifying, loud roar slash scream that resonated through my entire body. The only thing close to this is the energy that goes through your body when lightning strikes close by. It scared the absolute shit out of me. As I've heard koala, koala bulls roar, and this was not that, it shook me that bad that I took off on my bike tearing my ACL ligament on a log in the grass that my foot caught on. Oh, that must have hurt. Didn't stop till I got home. I've heard since that there had been a few sightings of Sabe running over a six foot deer fence in a normal gait without a pause in some hunter's spotlights at the same time in a similar area not too far away. I had to get to the hospital, obviously. Sure as shit. Sure as shit, wasn't game to tell the doctor it happened because I was running away from the Sabbath noise. Ha <laughs> ha. Might have been committed to the funny farm. Everyone I was told dismissed it off as a bull koala, except for the strange deadpan look I got from my SAS commando sniper cousin when I told him the story at a family event. I wonder what he knows. But no way in hell was that sound anything I've heard before or thankfully since. Hope this adds to your channel. Good on you, Steve, for all you do, Tanya. Tanya, of course I add to the channel and thank you so much for that share. You're not alone in Australia. There's been dozens of sightings sent in from Australia, right? And here's an idea. Uh, possibly send this video to your cousin if you can. Email your cousin with it and then he will know that uh, there's definitely a very large group of people who are 
deadpan serious about this sub subject and maybe possibly it will need your him to share what he knows. I guarantee you we know something. Guaranteed. But anyway, thanks again for sending that in. Man, it must have hurt when you tore that in the grass. Shit. It's endless. Here's a big one. I don't know what this is about, but it looks, I don't think it's too long. Who cares? I got nothing but time. <laughs> okay, this is titled The Rest of the Stories. Hey Steve, I wrote you a while ago. I'm the guy that has the Shelby GT350 car. Oh yeah, that sounds familiar totally, man. And I want to share the rest of my family's and mine experiences with you. I told you about my grandfather's stories about him being chased by a Sasquatch on his bike and the one time it slapped beside the door of the house he was going in. Also something that jumped into the window of his bedroom that was on the second floor of his house that looked like a werewolf. Ugh. This experience happened on the outskirts of New Martinsville, West Virginia. I was a kid around 15 at the time when one night my mother and I had to tie up one of the dogs because it had to go to the vet and she didn't want to have to chase it all down the next day. My mother was there to hold the flashlight for me while I tie up the dogs to go to the outhouse. Sorry, when I tie up the dog to the dog house and the dog was panicked trying to get in the very back of the dog house trying to get into the very back of the doghouse as far as he yet. While this is going on, to the right of us in the woods was such a racket, like tree limbs breaking, snapping, and stomping around up there that it sounded like someone was having a temper tantrum. I was still trying to tie up the dog as this is going on and on at the time. Why am I screwing this up? It's really spaced weird how it's saved onto my notes. I'll try that again. Sorry, you guys. I was still trying to tie up the dog as this was going on, and at the time I thought this was a huge herd of deer making that noise. All right, calm as miss. As I was about to finish tying up the dog, the light suddenly vanished, and my mom was shining the light up in the woods saying, I think there's something up there. I told her that it was just deer up there making that noise, but she was still scared. This kept ha happening a couple times, me about to get the dog tied up and then the light would be gone. Then all of a sudden, all noise came to a halt for a second and then made a beeline straight for us stepping over a four and a half foot fence towards us. Oof. My mother screamed at me to leave the stupid dog alone and grabbed the collar of my t-shirt and dragged me down the hill to the house. Once she reached the side door of the house, she opened the door with one hand and with the other she slung me into the house with her with her jumping in and closing the door at the same time. I tumbled into the house as my mother told my dad that was sitting in his chair that there's something outside. Dad reached down on his ashtray stand and grabbed a P-38 and he proceeded to go outside and check what was out there. When he got back in, he said he didn't see anything out there. Around the same area in my front of my house, around the same area in front of my house in the summertime, my brother and I was taking a, talking to a friend they were spending the night at another one of our friends' house down the road from us that night. We were BSing for a few hours on the bridge over the creek in front of the house and not realize how late it had gotten. He decides to go to the friend's house and he got about 100 feet away from us. Just around a turn, there was an old dead tree standing between the creek and the road when something stepped out behind him. He turned around and saw about a nine foot tall, hairy creature about three feet away, towering over him. That's got to be your worst nightmare ever, right? Worst ever. He let out a scream and started to flat out run away back home in New Martinsville that was five miles away. On his way home, he passed by his friends. They were out looking for him, which they called out to him, but he did not see or hear at all. One of our friends chased him down and grabbed him. As he was grabbing him, he started to fight and then broke down and started to cry because he thought he was caught. Shit. When my mom was young, back in the late 1940s, she said when she was out playing in a field, when her brothers came up to her and told her to run because there was a man walking in the woods in a bear suit. Her younger sister froze when they were told to run and she said, when, sorry, her, her youngest sister, froze when they were told to run. And she said, 
when was frozen in the field that it walked right behind her as it passed. Must have been when she was frozen in the field that it walked right behind her as it passed. She said she could feel the hair of the suit brushed up against her back. Ooh. I thought a lot about this last story of the mom's sister in the field and it just does not make sense to me. It was rural, West Virginia, in the late 40s. There's not a lot of people living in that area and also poor. Who could afford a bear suit back in the late 40s? And why would they go walking in the middle of the woods? Who are they going to scare when there's no one around? Why would they say run, too, if it was just a man in a bear suit and not just ask, what are you doing? Or warn that person that he could get a shot doing what he's doing. What do you think about this, Steve? Thanks really for all you were doing. The true measure of a man is found in his maturity. You seem to be handling this enormous task with grace. As a friend of mine used to say, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. <laughs> Thanks, and you use my name, Paul Oates. P.S. I love all types of cars. Would love to see your 68 Camaro. I do own a 2017 Shelby Mustang GT350 350 with about 600 horsepower. That must sound cool when it opens up. My wife has a 74 Corvette convertible with a 383 stroker and a four speed. So I could take you for a ride in either one or both of them, lol. That'd be pretty fun. But thanks again for sending that in, man. What do I think about the bear shoot story? I think you, it's obvious, it's a no brainer. It's an absolute suicide move to put on a bear suit and run around in any forest where it's A, rural and people are armed and possibly hunting. It just is. Or where there's other bears. <laughs> right? You couldn't, even right here, you know where all the bears are that are filmed down by the river behind the house there? You couldn't pay me to put on a bear suit and run around in the back corner. I don't need one of those monsters mounting me in the bushes, right? <laughs> or even attacking or whatever, right? You just, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't put on a bear suit. You either trigger another predator to, a predator to attack you, or worse, you're gonna trigger a human being to freaking put a hole in you, right? Yeah, we know what it was. You know what it was. Thanks again for that email, man. You know what it was. Here's another one. It's funny, I went away fishing yesterday, didn't check the emails, because I normally do, and I try to grab as many as I can, put them in the notes, and I cracked them open this morning, and I'm scrolling through and scrolling through and scrolling through and scrolling through with all the new emails just that came in yesterday. It's insane. And it obviously needs to be talked about, and it's obvious there's been a lot of bullshit fed to us for many years, right? Enough's enough, enough of the bullshit. It's title Sasquatch Story. Good morning. I was recently introduced to your YouTube channel and find it very interesting. My story took place about 14 years ago now in Western Washington. I just moved back to the area after having lived in Eastern Oregon for a couple of years. I was staying at my folks place about 30 miles, 30 minutes west of the capital city, Olympia, until I could find a more permanent place of my own. My folks, house was situated at the dead end of a long gravel road. The only neighbors we had at that time were to the east and south of us. Everything west and north was rough timberland for tens of miles. One night in early October, I decided I would sleep outside on the trampoline. We would play for hour on as hours on as kids. Shortly after falling asleep, I was awakened by a loud scream or a howl. I would estimate 50 to 70 yards from me in the timber. I sat up and just listened. I could hear the thing moving loudly through the thick underbrush, and it soon began knocking on trees but other large chunks of wood. I sat petrified, unable to see anything, but continued listening. The thing let off more screams, and then way off in the distance, maybe half a mile away, I heard an identical scream. I guess they were communicating to each other. Growing up, I was in the woods constantly, and even my work prior to that was all in the woods. I had never heard anything like this before in my life. I've seen cougar, bear, elk, etc. I cannot think of any animal that makes the same call I heard that night. I was talking with my mom the following morning and she said she heard the screams before. And I too, later that year, heard it again, but from inside the house. The whole event took maybe five to ten minutes. It is a memory I look back on and wonder if it was a Sasquatch. You can share this story in its entirety. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, Kevin. You know what I'm gonna say? 
You went out of your way to, to find this YouTube channel and then went out of your way to find the email address and then went out of your way to, to type out what happened, what you heard and send it in. That tells us all and yourself, you already know what it was, right? You know what it was. It's the same thing that tens of thousands of other people have heard. It's funny, that reminded me when you told that one. Uh, we're, on, we're, in, we're in North, where were we? North of, um, uh, 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 brain fart, big city in Alaska. Anyway, far north of where you land in Alaska, the International Airport. Another bush plane flight out, and there's a guide with us. And I was filming an uh, Alaskan brown bear hunt, and I was a camera guy and helping. And uh, the guide told us about, he didn't believe in this at all, but he had a story that he was in Oregon at friends during the off season, went for a hike up in the property in the back to camp out up in the hill with his dog. Golden, golden Lab Retriever, I remember it all. And he said something circled him and his dog while they had the fire going all night long, screaming and roaring at them. The dog was shitting itself and he just kept the fire going and couldn't wait. And it got daylight out, then the thing finally shut up and they took off and left. But he doesn't believe in these things. <laughs> yeah, it's a common thing, man. Shit. What do we got here? Here's another one. Hi Steve, you may need, oh this is titled 1961 and 2018. Excuse me. Hi Steve, you may use my name, Ricky Warnick. My family moved to Ladner, Wyoming, June of 61 for the summer. I just turned 13. I was a young teenager's, it was a young teenager's dream. I had a motor scooter and would get on it and explore the mountain roads or go fishing. I love the outdoors, but I'm by no means a hunter or fisherman, although I've done both. One summer night in the summer of 61, several friends and I were riding our scooters down to the bottoms. My word is I don't recall what they're called. Lots of tall brush and trees that grow in river bottoms. My friends told me of a wild man that supposedly lived there. We were having fun for about half an hour and suddenly all of us were hit with a wave of fear. Imagine or not, we all took off as quickly as possible. I never rode down there again. If anyone from Ladner, from Lander, Lander, knows of this so-called wild man, perhaps they would respond and verify or not. I didn't know what a Sasquatch was at 13. I'm now 73, and what I experienced in northern New Mexico summer of 2018 was very strange. While hiking north of my son's cabin and up the mountain about four to 500 feet, the thought that I was being watched by a Sasquatch came sharply into mind. I wasn't even thinking about Sasquatch. I know of no Sasquatch sightings in this area, but the feeling persisted for about 20 minutes. I zoomed my digital camera in and scanned the area from which I felt I was being watched and took pictures, but upon examining them, I did not see anything. I did mention what happened to my wife. It was so strange. I don't know if there was one close or my imagination kicked in. I did feel some discomfort emotionally. Not fear or foreboding, but just not quite right. I've been watching you for about a year. My wife and I both believe these beings exist. I believe I know what they are because of their genetics. I don't for a minute think they're some kind of protectors or benevolent beings in any way. My best to you and your family. Be safe. Ricky Warnick, old Marine Vietnam vet. Ricky, absolutely appreciate you, man. Big time. Yeah, when you, uh, you try to explain to people that fear that fear and anxiety that comes over you out of nowhere. And when you guys, for the rest of you listening to this, you gotta think about that. You got, a, you got a veteran that goes out of his way to email us about just about the feeling that he had one day in the forest. Obviously it's pretty intense, right? To make a, a lifelong lasting impression on you. Oh, here's another side note. Me and Sarah and I were talking yesterday and guess what? Yesterday, all of a sudden she tells me at one time she's walking her dog there north of Squamish British, Squamish, British Columbia around this park, this lake, and she felt lost and absolutely terrified because she thought they were being stalked by a cougar and the dog was absolutely shitting itself. And I'm like, what? You just tell me this now. She goes, well, I don't know. I didn't really, I never really thought about it until we were talking about the cougars next door. They were the next door the night before last, and that's what brought it up. And I said to her, I go, why would you think that it was a cougar? 
She's like, I don't know. I just felt like something was, was staring, at us, staring at us and stalking us and the dog was going crazy. Go figure, right? All right, moving on. Moving along. Moving along. This is titled 2015 Hunting Experience. Hey Steve, I hope all is well with you and your crew. I just want to share an experience that I had while hunting in late September, early October 2015. My name is Philip White and I've been watching and listening to your videos for the past year or more. My experience happened while on an annual hunting trip that I take with a couple of friends of mine north of Lac La Biche, Alberta. Ship house of sightings around there. We set up a wall tent after arriving at a usual spot and got situated. I decided to leave and do a little scouting on my quad where we hunted. I decided to venture and drive a couple of branches of the cut blocks where we were. I drove down an old connector road that was full of tall grass and old felled trees. I was approaching a clear cut and decided to walk and maybe get a look at any deer in the area. As I walked through the grass, I heard something digging or tearing at roots. I wasn't sure what it was and was a little freaked out. I chambered around and decided to wait and see what it might be. I could catch a glimpse of black in between the leaves, but eventually figured it was a bear and decided to back out. The thing about it, the thing about it was that usually bears will flee in a hurry when you approach them. Could have been a juvenile. The next morning we got up, made coffee, and decided on where we would go for the next day, for that day. I left and went into the area where I was the previous day, but at a different loop. The morning was foggy and unusually warm. I drove to the loop where I was going to walk, parked the quad, and proceeded to walk up the loop. I remember that it was really quiet. The sun wasn't up, but it was bright. When I got to the top of the hill which I was climbing, the silence was shattered. I heard the loudest scream slash yell slash roar that I've ever heard. I was frozen. I managed to chamber around and raise my rifle. Then, 10 seconds later, I heard it again. Immediately, you start to go through all the animals that are native to the area. Moose, whitetail, caribou, black bear, maybe a mountain lion. No way. To me, there is nothing known of that possesses the volume that can create that noise. I was at least 200 yards from the tree line. The cut block was at least 400 yards long. I scanned the area and saw nothing. After the second scream, we were there were numerous coyote yelps from the area in several different locations. To me, maybe whatever made the noise was pissed off. I was being pestered by the dogs. Maybe it had a kill. I stuck around but heard and saw nothing. After several minutes, the sun broke through the fog. The birds started to sing and the things returned to normal. When I returned to camp, I regurgitated what had happened to the boys and they probably thought I was a little crazy. I know what I heard. And to me, there's only one answer, Sasquatch. I'm not sure if it was that evening or the evening after. I was tucked away on a hill overlooking another cut block location when out of nowhere, I heard voices, people talking, but couldn't hear what they were saying. As far as I knew, I was the only person in there. And after listening for several minutes, I decided it may have been someone picking berries or camping and decided to leave. These thoughts and memories were buried for a couple of years until I watched a show on Netflix and all the thoughts came flooding back. I've been a believer ever since. I've told everyone that I work with and have no regrets and have, a, and have heard from a co-worker who had a sighting near Rocky Mountain House in the early 90s as well as another co-worker whose father saw one around House River while traveling Highway 63. I'm originally from the East Coast and travel home usually once a year and all a person has to do is look out the window of an airplane to realize that there is a great amount of land that these people could inhabit and stay hidden with ease. These creatures are worldwide without a doubt, masters of their domain. Keep the great work you're doing well, re really appreciate it, Philip White. Okay, Philip, thanks for that, man. And uh, if you ask around more and more out in Alberta, you're going to come up with a shit pile of sightings. It's kind of funny, I was almost thinking, well, I've always thought about it the other time, like this, this trip I'm about to go on, I'm not sure. My, I don't have my schedule lined out. I, I never get that organized, I just go. And um, I do have to go to the coastal mountains in the interior of British Columbia first. I have to go in, on a big hike and retrieve five or six more trail cameras from there. 
before I leave to go north. That sometimes I always think that I might one day I should just go to say Clearwater, British Columbia ish and start driving from Clearwater at about midnight, maybe one in the morning, and then keep driving towards Jasper. But I'm going to be hanging a left and going up through McBride because that stretch of highway, if you were to go from Clearwater, British Columbia, follow that highway, Vailmont Blue River, or Blue River Vailmont, go past the turn off to Jasper, keep going up through McBride, and all the way up that valley to Prince George. That strip has so many frickin' nighttime sightings in those highway stre stretches, it's absolutely mind-boggling. Even the RCMP were telling a girlfriend of mine in Jasper that there is so many sightings called in from towards BC, the Jasper BC border on that chunk of highway. It's, it's endless, it's endless. But if I was to do that, then it absolutely screws you up for the whole next day and you're exhausted and messes up your whole sleep. So I don't know, I'm not that enthused, but if you're, for anybody who is, <laughs> go get one of those dash cams and try it. Drive from, uh, I don't know, leave the Clearwater, British Columbia around midnight and drive to Prince George that way, fall the pavement. See what you get on film, right? Anyway, thanks for that email again, man. Keep them coming in. If you find anything that helps, anything you come across that might help the people, you get it in me. I'll get it to the people, all right? Here's another one. Baby Sasquatch visited me. Is the title of this email and to us. Hi, Steve. I came across your channel recently. I wonder if I should share my story. People who share on your channel talk about these beings being frightening and dangerous. And though I do not know. And though I do not doubt this is possible, my story is very different. I live in the Pacific Northwest, and a few years ago, my beloved senior dog died. I do not have children, so this little guy was my baby boy. Oh, that sucks. Sorry to hear that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, I just lost where I was. And I was not handling the loss very well. I couldn't seem to get past it. I was crying all the time. Late one night, I heard something outside. I thought it was someone breaking into my camper truck again. So I quietly went outside and snuck up on the back of the truck. That's brave of you. <clears throat> As I was stepping up onto the tailgate of the truck, I saw something underneath it. I quickly jumped down to get another look, but it was gone. What I saw was about twice the size of a big raccoon. It had long, medium gray hair, this seemed to stick straight out from its head. But what really remembered, what I really remembered so vividly was its large, round, light blue eyes. They seemed to kind of glow because they were so vivid. It telepathed to me, I'm sorry you lost you, baby. Holy shit. I don't know about you, or I do not know about you or your channel at this time. Oh, sorry. I did not know about you or your channel at this time. Therefore, I did not know these guys can just vanish. So I started to crawl under the truck to find it. It was adorable and I wanted to get a closer look, but right about then I got this strange feeling that his mom might be larger and she might possibly be overprotective. So I went back into my home. I'm not sure why I knew this was a baby and not a full grown being, I just knew. Also, I knew it was sending compassion and possibly even love. Anyway, after this visit, that deep grief I felt was gone. Holy shit. Of course, I still feel grief, felt grief, but it was now more manageable. Thanks for all you do. Now I know what that little creature might have been. Stay safe and use my name if you want. Elizabeth Mizzy, M-I-Z-E. That's quite the story, Elizabeth. I mean, you know, by now we've had, I don't know, dozens and dozens and dozens of people email in about the, uh, getting a message thought right, right into your head. That was definitely a different type of, uh, description. That's for sure. I don't think we've had that tip, that specific description. And yet, I don't think, I don't know. Crazy man. It's endless. Endless, endless. No, I haven't any of your... Or, uh, curious. I haven't messaged Edgar yet, or anybody. I haven't, 
one of these things when I like to go away and finally do my own thing out in the middle of nowhere is I like to finally get a hold of people that I haven't been able to or I just haven't for a while. It's all stacked up. I got a lot of people I gotta reply back to. Messages, text messages, emails, whatever. And uh, Edgar's on the top of my list, you guys, all right? Just so you know, once I get out of here. Because when I'm here, obviously the last few weeks, I haven't had a second to do anything. All right. This looks like a bit of a book. Oops, oh shit, I just lost it. There we go, okay, found it again. Let's see what this one's about. This is titled, Am I Crazy? I don't know if you read this or not. I think so. It wasn't Marcus Brad. My name is Jeff. I'm a rap artist known as Rhett Hearse. I want to eventually make a song about my experience and mention you on the round table. Anyways, I've had numerous experiences with these beings. Some possibly were something else, I'm not sure. I live in Utah. My first experience is when I was 13. My younger brother and mom had gone camping in Little Cottonwood Canyon. Everything was going fine, but when it started getting dark, my brother got sick. He and my mom decided to walk to the ranger station about a mile away from camp while I stayed at camp. I guess they experienced horrible uneasiness and fear on the way back to camp. It was completely dark, and they finally returned. And suddenly, out of nowhere, my mom grabbed us and told us to get in the car. We had to leave everything behind, and she drove out of there like a bat out of hell. When we asked why, she just said that she wanted to go home and hated camping. Later, while Eve was dropping on her conversation with my grandmother, I overheard her saying the reason we left so quickly was because she saw glowing eyes about 10 feet from camp. She also said her instinct was to leave. Not sure what it was, but I think I kind of do. My second experience was while camping about six miles up on the mountains. I was 15 and had my two brothers and a friend with me. Throughout the night, we heard heavy footfalls circling our camp. My older brother insisted that it was a pipeline thumping under the ground. I remember saying that was ridiculous due to being where we were. Anyways, the footfalls continued all night, and that was luckily all that occurred. My third experience was a solo hike off path in Butterfield Canyon. I was 22 years old, so this is about 2002. I was about to exit the woods and enter a small field when I was suddenly stopped by a feeling inside telling me not to continue forward. I shrugged it off and literally took three steps forward when I heard a horrific growling coming from behind some bushes ahead. I grabbed my camera and took a picture in hopes of catching whatever it was, but no luck. I got the F out of there nonetheless. Experience four was in 2020 and occurred in my backyard. I live in the suburbs, pretty far from nature. I thought I was going nuts. So here's what happened. I was walking through this one acre field near my house and decided to take a picture of this area that looked like a Bigfoot blind. I shrugged it off thinking it was most likely made by some kids. When I got home and looked at the picture and noticed several blurry beings, many different kinds of beings, some looked like zombies, some like aliens, and some like savvy. It was crazy. I showed it to a couple of friends and they noticed them as well. I thought it was neat and decided to go back and take a video. The next day I went back and took a short video. I know it sounds crazy, but I swear that when playing the video at very slow speed, I could see tons of beings. They moved very fast and blended in very well. It was a trip. It almost looked like they were angry and I felt this feeling that I was trespassing. Later that night, on my front porch smoking a cigarette, it was about 2.30 in the morning and extremely quiet. Across the street, there is a huge pine tree. It's the smaller ones around it. I was staring at it as if something was watching me. I figured it was just my imagination. Then, like a scene in a horror movie, there was glowing eyes in the tree. Then another and another. Five pairs of orange eyes, a couple bluish. I swear I was not imagining this. I was overwhelmed with terror and dread. So scared I couldn't move a damn muscle. I will lie, I literally shit my pants a little. Bowels completely loosened. I couldn't take my eyes off of them and had this feeling inside me telling me not to take any more videos or pictures and let them be. I don't know what these beings were, Steve. I slowly was able to inch my way to the door and without turning my back, I went inside. I was so scared 
that I sat near the door with a knife all night, keeping an eye through the window. They were gone. I eventually decided that maybe I was tripping, but deep down I knew it was legit. A couple days later, I was on my back porch smoking around midnight and had this damn feeling of terror hit me again out of nowhere. Now I was pissed. What the hell did I do now, I thought. I couldn't see anything because my backyard is pitch black, no lights out there. I could sense where it was coming from, and it was only about 15 feet from me. I slowly backed up to the door and felt if I turned my back, it would grab me. I quickly went inside and couldn't close the door fast enough. I swear, a voice within was telling me to run inside. It was so strange and random. Sorry for the long email. There's a little more. I hope that's okay. A couple days later, I was in my room recording a track and just doing my thing. I happened to glance over to the corner of my room, and no lie, there was an effing Bigfoot face sticking out from the wall, like phasing through, just staring at me. I froze in terror, and it quickly vanished. Yeah, I know, it sounds insane, especially since I live in the city and the nearest forest or mountain is 10 miles away. I don't know what it was. I'm not sure if I'm crazy or if it was real. I wish I was crazy, to be honest. I went back to that field the next day and spoke out loud. I'll leave you guys, I'll leave you guys alone if you leave me alone. I guess it worked, I think. I do have loud slap sounds hit my garage at night when I smoke in there. I appreciate you taking the time to read this email. Thank you for all you do. I have mad respect for your homie. For you, homie. Much love. Keep fighting the good fight. F the mainstream and F the oppressors. All right, man. Jeff, thanks for this. Thanks for sending that in. And um, just I'm imagining if there is many people out there who live in suburbia who have had something similar happen. If there is people out there who have some has had that happen, I don't imagine too many people are going to be too willing to share it publicly anywhere, right? I mean, what more could you have happen possibly in the private of your own home to make you think that you might be losing your shit? Right? It sounds a little out there. But I don't know. I can't say if it happened or not. I have a freaking clue. I know there's some outrageous, crazy shit going on with our true reality for sure. So that being said, anything's possible, right? So, on that note, if you have had something similar happen to this, as, as this has happened to this man, comment on in the comment section below this email or I guess email it into me and I'll share with the people, all right? Because who knows? I don't know, I don't, I don't have the answers, but I'm definitely not the person to say it didn't happen, that's for sure. Anyway, this is it, last one. Well, hopefully not the last one, obviously, but uh, those are the horses banging their excuse me, feed buckets on the other side of the wall where I'm going to cut the windows in the wall so they can stick their heads in and visit. And if you're wondering what that banging is, it's not a Sasquatch on the outside of the man cave. <laughs> there we go. That's it. From now on, I will be in the middle of frickin' nowhere talking to you guys. And I'm going to use that new GoPro so I can load it onto my phone. And then when I have Wi-Fi or whatever, I'll, uh, I'll post the updates. And I'll share with you the adventure, where I am, what I'm seeing, and people's voices, all right? And yes, I will be armed, and yes, I'll have my personal locator with me. So there, and in the, and in the future too, for all you people who decide you need to go out of your way to alert me that somebody may, be sent, may be, somebody may be saying bad things about me or this channel, just don't worry about it. If anything, all you, if you feel, if you feel you need to say something in those, those places, all you need to say is, thank you so much for promoting this channel of truth, <laughs> right? Because that's all they're doing is they're promoting this channel and all of your voices. Okay? So thank you. Anyway, I'll be back. I'll be back from the middle of nowhere soon. Oh, uh, Share my story at howtohunt.com if any of you are wondering, where's the email, where's the email? Got it. We got to get my encounter shared with everybody. Share my story at howtohunt.com. All right? Later.